so welcome. My name is Betty Cruz, and I'm with the World Affairs Council team. I'm president and CEO. Just uh, had my three-year anniversary uh, earlier in January. And I was just sharing that this feels kind of like year one, because this will be the first year fully back, and also kind of like year 10, because of the last couple of years I've been suffering. But here we are, and I'm so grateful to be here with all of you. Um, our mission at the Council is to convene and connect people on, around global issues, uh, to build a thriving, competitive, and inclusive Pittsburgh. And our vision is for a globally-minded, globally-connected world that's equitable and just for all. Pretty bold, because it's going to take all of us to get there. Now, before we get started, we want to acknowledge that we're located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples, including the Seneca, Lenape, Osage, and Shawnee. Through this acknowledgement, we invite you to join us in paying respect to the elders, both past and present. Now, it's my pleasure to kick it back to Ugo Cruz. Uh, Ugo is a Cuban composer, drummer, producer, percussionist, and teacher. And although Ugo won't be talking about diplomacy with us today, we're going to save that for Ambassador Rubin, there's definitely plenty that can be said when we're looking at the role of U.S. diplomacy around the world, including places like Cuba. And Ugo brings to life uh, one of the issues that we at the Council are going to be focusing on this year, uh, which is global migration and its importance and impact around the world and places like this world. So, Hugo, thank you for being here. If you can share a few remarks, then. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. How are you all doing? Well, first, I want to say thank you so much to the Foreign Affairs Council for having me, and also Betty Cruz for this beautiful invitation. Thank you so much. Um, no, what I want to share really quick is just like, um, I've been in Pittsburgh for uh, four years. It was uh, this past Sunday was my fourth anniversary. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you learned before. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm really blessed and, and glad to be here in Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh has given me the opportunity to do so many things that I long time ago I thought they were impossible. So thank you so much so much Pittsburgh and uh I'll give it back to you. Play one more song for us. Oh, that's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. So, for those of you that don't know these uh, instruments that I'm performing here today, this is a Cuban instrument that uh, it got this uh, this way that you see it today uh, from Africa in Cuba because in Cuba we have a lot of uh, African culture uh, from Yoruba, Arara, Abaqua. So. All of those cultures, they have different type of um, drums, and this is one of them. Conga drums, conga drums. These ones are bongos. They are originally from Cuba. They are Cuban instruments. They were born and developed in Cuba to the whole world, to Puerto Rico, uh, Jamaica, United States, China, Russia, everywhere. And this is a, an Afro-Peruvian instrument called Cajon. It's an instrument that was uh, brought from the from people from Africa to Peru. And that's how we got it today. It's very famous in Spain, they play it. And I wanna share, because we're talking about world, I'm gonna share some of the uh, world's rhythms that I know. I hope you like it.
like to invite up Dean Steve Tanzelli. He's the Dean of the Roman School of Business here at Point Park University. Oh, my, my watch is talking oh. back to me. <laughs> hey, we have that class all the time. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, definitely a tough act for me to follow. Uh, I want to recognize uh, Dr. Uh, Heather Starfiedler. Uh, Dr. Fiedler uh, oversees our community engagement leadership program uh, that is housed in the School of Business. Uh, and one of the things that we try so hard to do here at Point Park is not just raise terrific accountants and IT professionals, but, but more importantly, under Heather's tutelage, uh, graduate good people. I graduate good students, students that are willing and able to give back and understand the importance of what it means to live and prosper in downtown Pittsburgh. And that's why, you know, an event like tonight, we'd love to host and love to get our students involved. Uh, so thank you, Heather, for, for doing the good work to host this. Uh, I'm not sure how many folks are familiar with uh, Point Park, but I'll be very brief. We have about 3,200 students. We have about 1,000 that live right here on campus. Uh, and we strive every day uh, to not only provide the skills that our students need to know to be employable, but also to try to make a difference uh, here in Pittsburgh and within the region. So thank you once again for, for being here. Uh, it is with uh, great pleasure to partner with the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh, uh, Luminary, Global Pittsburgh, the Global Shapers, uh, to co-host tonight's event on the state of U.S. diplomacy and to welcome Ambassador Eric Rubin to our campus. Uh, Ambassador Eric Rubin was elected to serve as the president of the American Foreign Service Association after his recent posting as U.S. Ambassador to Bulgaria from 2016 to 2019. Joining the Foreign Service in 1985 after graduating from Yale, he started as a political and human rights officer in Honduras. In 1989, he was assigned to the State Department's Operations Center, and from 1989, in 1991, he worked in the Office of Soviet Union Affairs, where he monitored and reported on the collapse of the Soviet Union. Next, he served as a security affairs officer for Central and Eastern Europe. He left Washington in 1994 for Kiev, Ukraine, as deputy political counselor. While there, he was the recipient of the AFSA William R. Reagan Award for constructive dissent by the mid-level officers for his work on the Bosnia crisis. In 1996, he returned to work uh, to Washington to work for the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Canadian Affairs. From 1997 to 1998, he served as the Assistant White House Press Secretary for Foreign Affairs, and in 1998, he was a special assistant to Ambassador Thomas Pickering, then the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. Ambassador Rubin was a Rust, Rust Fellow at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University, where he enjoyed teaching about diplomacy. In 2001, he was posted to Thailand as the General Counsel, and in 04, he returned to Washington, D.C. as the Director of the Office of Policy, Planning, and Coordination uh, in the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. In 2006, he served as the Executive Assistant to R. Nichols Burns, the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs at the time. From 2008 to 2011, he served as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Moscow. And from 2011 to 2015, he served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. Ambassador Rubin is married and has two children. This evening, Ambassador Rubin will be in conversation with Board of World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh President and CEO Ben Cruz, who we just met. Ben uh, has extensive experience in community outreach, communications, partnership building, and program management. She developed an immigrant, immigrant inclusion strategy and other citywide initiatives uh, for former mayor Bill Caputo. Managed major accounts for a national nonprofit dedicated to building playgrounds across the United States and supported public relations for global brands. Betty assumed the role of president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh in January of 2020. So it's my great pleasure 
turn this evening over to Betty and look forward to a terrific conversation. Welcome to Point Park. Thank you very much for both of you.
and that we have to earn that leadership, and we also have to earn the prosperity and security that our people expect and the American people need. So that's how I frame that, that first answer. Thank you for that. I really love your emphasis on leadership, and I'm sure we'll be coming back to, to those points and the questions um, from the audience. Um, I'd like to, to focus in a minute on, so this year, our core areas of, of attention at the World Affairs Council is uh, global migration, climate crisis, women and girls. Huge issues, many intersecting components to them. Looking back at your work, what you've done around the world, with Central America, Europe, Asia, can you speak to what you're seeing as it relates to these, these core issues, um, both in terms of challenges and then maybe bright spots? Sure. Um, you know, it's a tough year to talk about bright spots, but I, I will find some. But the challenges are big and they're real, and you mentioned migration. Um, in, in modern recorded history, this is by far the biggest migration crisis that any civilization, certainly in terms of numbers, has faced. And I don't just mean American uh, problems and challenges. I mean the whole world. People, when I was studying history, used to say, that what we saw at the end of World War II with the massive displacement uh, after the end of the war and the massive migrations, what we then saw in uh, the subcontinent in, in South Asia when India and Pakistan and later Bangladesh broke apart and the forced population transfers, that those were the greatest forced migrations, the greatest refugee crisis, crises that had ever been seen and likely ever would be seen again. Well, jump ahead to the past decade, the numbers are bigger now, and frankly, the suffering and the challenge is bigger now, partly because it's in so many places. And um, we're, we're facing north-south challenges, we're, we're facing climate challenges, which directly affect migration, as I, I think everybody in this room knows, and people can't make a living, and this is happening now in Central America, it's happening in the Sahel and in North Africa. If agriculture is collapsing, partly because of drought, and the disappearance of topsoil, which I'm personally familiar with from my time in Honduras, and people can't get a living from the land. They crowd into the cities. Uh, there isn't enough work and there isn't enough food. And they decide they have to get up and move. Um, one of the things I would say, if you have time, go to YouTube and uh, look at a video of the Spanish enclave of Melilla which is in Morocco. Spain has two cities that are on the coast of North Africa, surrounded by Morocco that they've had for over 500 years, that they will not give up, even though they insist the British give up Gibraltar. That's another story. I'm not going to go there. Um, but look at one of the videos and see what the reality is. The reality is that with help from the European Union, the Spanish have built 75-foot uh, fences that in part are electrified that are topped by barbed wire. And I mean 75 feet high. I mean 30 meter fences. And watch the videos of these young Africans scaling the fences, trying to get over the electrified part of the fence, trying to get over the barbed wire and then drop 75 feet and hope they survive the drop and that they don't break every bone in their body. Thankfully, the Spanish police are not shooting at them when they do this. They're rounding them up um, and holding them, uh, unlike some other parts of the world. But it, it's shocking and terrifying. And I, I cite it just because I recently watched it and said, if people are willing to do that, um, we're not just talking desperate. We're, we're talking about people who decided that they have nothing to lose. And that is, is powerful. So when you add the climate challenges, and I don't to try to, to educate people here about the climate challenges, but they're very real and they affect everything else. So just in terms of agriculture and disease, um, all of the transnational problems that we're facing. Uh, and now, of course, when you have millions of people being displaced, you have problems like human trafficking because people are vulnerable and people are susceptible to being victimized. And frankly, you know what's going on in some cases with human trafficking is really trafficking and, and slavery. Uh, vulnerable people are being turned into to slaves uh, by, frankly, evil people who are taking advantage of this moment of instability. So there are all these transnational issues which affect all of us, and the last pitch I'll make on that is that's why we can't solve any of these problems alone, and that's why the institutions that we helped create uh, have to
after World War II, like the United Nations and all the UN agencies, uh, are so important uh, because without, uh, for example, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, we can't even begin to, to tackle this, and um, certainly not as, as our country alone. Thank you. Thank you for that sobering, important uh, information. And we'll, we'll come back to so We have some folks in the audience I know that are doing important uh, refugee resettlement work here in Pittsburgh. So thank you for spotlighting that a bit more deeply. Um, let's get into some uh, country uh, specific issues. Um, and then please start getting your questions ready because we'll be moving to the audience uh, soon. Uh, so starting with the invasion of Russia and Ukraine, uh, given your expertise in this area, what's your take? on U.S. policy, working with NATO, and how we're supporting Ukraine. Sure. I mean, I would start out just by saying for someone who has spent an entire career, and, and frankly, even before this career, I first studied Russian in public high school in the 1970s. Uh, I studied Russian all through college. Um, this has been both a fascination and a commitment. When I say Russian, I just mean the language. The entire region has been, been the biggest focus of, of my intellectual uh, journey, but also my personal career. And it's, it's a devastating time because uh, we are seeing things that I, honestly none of us imagined. And I would go so far as to say almost no one in Russia or Ukraine or anywhere in the region imagined this. And we actually know for a fact that they did not because our government was having discussions up to the weeks before the Russians invaded a year ago, just about a year ago. And the Ukrainian leadership and all the neighboring countries, they, they certainly didn't trust the Russians. They certainly felt that they were being threatened and intimidated and bullied. But the idea that Russia would do what Russia has done um, truly came as a shock. And it came as a shock to, I think, many Russians as well um, for multiple reasons. One is that there cannot possibly be a good outcome to this, uh, and that is increasingly apparent. Uh, but second of all, because it really blew up so many of the basic structures and certainties that the whole world system, the whole international system was built up. And people forget when we were dealing with the Soviet Union, including after World War II when we were dealing with Stalin and an expansionist Soviet Union uh, that literally supported efforts to take over all of Korea, to take over uh, all of, of Europe originally, and then uh, later on, pieces of Europe, but certainly uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, was was conquered. Um, we still had much more of a framework for negotiations, for discussions, uh, and you know, I talk about when you read the diplomatic history, and I met some of the people from those days. You know, our ambassadors when they went to Moscow met with Stalin, and they they met with the Soviet leadership and. Soviet leadership came to our 4th of July receptions at our ambassador's residence. Not Stalin, but Khrushchev did, and Brezhnev did, and all the other leaders. And we had a dialogue going, and, and Vice President Nixon went to Moscow shortly after Stalin fell in the mid-50s, and President Eisenhower, and President Kennedy, and President Johnson, and President Nixon, and President Ford, and President Carter, and uh, continuing uh, President Bush, uh, uh, President Clinton and President George uh, W. Bush all had extensive uh, hours long, days long engagements with the Russian leadership. Uh, that ended, uh, I would say, uh, with the Russian uh, reinvasion of Georgia in 2008. Uh, it completely ended in 2014 with the Russian, first Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Um, and we're at such a low point now that there really isn't the possibility of dialogue it's not that we don't want it, it's just that practically impossible. We're dealing with a web of falsehoods and, and bizarre parallel universes that makes having a serious discussion really difficult. Uh, and they're putting out stuff to the Russian people that's shocking. For example, uh, the main evening news program two nights ago in Moscow uh, told the Russian people that just like during World War II, uh, Europe is united against Russia in support of the Nazis and the fascists, and America is on their side. Uh, just like in World War II. Uh, now, nobody discounts the fact that the Soviet Union paid a horrific price, a heroic price, for defeating uh, Nazi Germany. But they did it with us and the other allies, and we certainly were not supporting uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy uh, in, in 
World War II, it's outrageous, and you wouldn't suggest that. But that's what they're telling the Russian people, and you know what? You know, especially younger people, they probably haven't learned this in school, they have no idea. So that's the kind of thing that we're up against. But it also, you asked the question about the Allies in Europe. I mean, one positive thing I would say is, a year ago, even a lot of us were really pessimistic about having our ties with our allies in Europe and North America and Asia, uh, not just strengthen, but even just continue as they have been. And the question of whether NATO uh, would be able to continue as a relevant force. The question of whether America's commitment to European security, which was fundamental going back to World War, World War I, really, not just World War II, would continue. And all of that has changed. Uh, not entirely for the good. One thing, if you're following a lot of the analysis right now, what people are saying is, you know, Europe is back to following America's lead and relying on America for its own security. Well, it is. That's a fact. Um, and I'm not entirely happy about that. It's not to say the European allies are not spending a lot of money and providing a lot of military equipment and taking real risks and imposing energy sanctions. I mean, they're doing serious stuff. But it's with us in the lead again. Um, partly, I think that was inevitable. And again, that's why I said without American leadership, I don't think there would have been a credible response. Uh, but it does create imbalances that, that are reflected in our own domestic politics and our own conversations going into another election cycle here. So it's very complicated. Um, I won't predict, and we can talk more later if there's interest, how this is going to turn out, except to say I know that this is one of those moments in history that, that we are watching uh, to some extent in awe because the Ukrainian people, it's a big country, over 40 million people. Uh, it's the biggest country in Europe, if you don't count Russia as being in Europe. Um, they basically said they would rather die than, than surrender, and that's the majority view, and it's really quite serious from everything that, that we've seen. That's powerful, it's scary, um, what that means going forward uh, when they're up against the world's second, actually first nuclear weapon state, they have more nukes than the United States, it, it's very scary. But it's also, I think, inspiring in many ways, and it is clearly a turning point. Thank you. Switching gears to China, not necessarily less complicated, but different. Um, um, Looking at our US policy there, what's, what's changed in the last decade, and how can we best manage this competitive relationship? Um, I should start out by saying China is not my area of specialty, and I haven't done a lot of work on our relations with China. But I will say, um, compared again to those heady days in the 1990s, when the world was our oyster, when it seemed like everything was breaking our way, that was a time when there was a bipartisan consensus in this country and in Europe and in Japan and elsewhere that the way to solve our problems with China was to encourage change and reform and free trade and opening of China to the world. And that ultimately that would lead China to be a stakeholder in the international system, uh, the international legal system, the international commercial system that would encourage China to open up as a society because we believe that economic prosperity and creativity depend on a certain amount of openness and, and freedom and creativity. Um, and we also, going back before that time to the 1970s, believe that this was how we would balance other challenges because ultimately China had so much interest in the trade relationship and investment relationship with the West, with us, and with our European and Japanese allies. Um, and we really believe that, and both parties supported uh, giving normal trade relations to China, eliminating pretty much all tariffs. No one opposed sharing sensitive technology with China. No one opposed shifting so much of our technological production to China uh, from the United States, including the chip production, the, the, uh, all of the sophisticated chip production, the semiconductor production. Um, and there was an assumption that China was so far behind us militarily and economically that, well, maybe they'll catch up economically in a few decades. Militarily, no one will ever catch us. Everybody will be saying that. Well, no one has caught us militarily just yet, but I can honestly tell you the Chinese are on the horizon. And um, economically, they've got some problems now, as, as do we and others, but they are a colossus economically. And some of those assumptions that 
openness would come from the free trade, from the engagement with the world, turned out not apparently to be true. And I think the change really began when it became apparent with the Chinese walking away from their commitments on keeping Hong Kong autonomous and free, when they ramped up the rhetoric on Taiwan, which uh, wasn't entirely just the Chinese ramping up the rhetoric, it was also at times coming from Taiwan, but really uh, abandoned the, the stability that I think had existed on that. And when they started doing things like putting several million Muslims in re-education camps and um, trying to eradicate uh, minority cultures and faiths and languages in places like Tibet, um, even more than they had under Mao and you know, what we considered totalitarian communism. Um, and then when the rhetoric started to take an anti-American, anti-Western turn, uh, you got a reaction here, and I think now what we increasingly have is a bipartisan consensus here, that we have to oppose China economically, militarily, strategically. Um, it raises a lot of questions. One, is China really uh, a hostile power, or is China just trying to increase its power and influence? This is a question that's an open debate. The second question, the big one, is what do we do? So one question we can talk more about is, you know, is it good that so much of our military capability depends on, uh, on Chinese uh, technology that we no longer make in this country? Well, I would say no, that's not good. So President Biden has said, no, that's not good. We now have a multi-billion dollar initiative to bring some of that back here. Um, and some would say a little late, but good. But there are about 100 more things that follow from that. So I think uh, this is going to be a dominant factor in pretty much everything we see him do in, in the coming decade and beyond. Uh, but uh, once again, I think there, there are not any simple answers. So last stop on our very quick scan of some, some specific uh, regional or country issues. Going back to kind of where it all started for you, Latin America, Honduras, um, but really looking at the region, Latin America and Caribbean, from what we've seen in Haiti, in Brazil, in Peru, um, there's a lot that's happening that's shifting. Can you speak to any anything you're uh, closely watching? Yeah, so there are individual uh, problems that are related to larger issues. For example, Haiti is in meltdown. Uh, Haiti, as, as one person I know who spent seven years in Haiti and knows it really well, said, you know, Haiti has not had a good 300 years. <laughs> um, and they really have since they won independence from the French um, heroically. Uh, it's almost never been, been good to be in Haiti. But it's worse now, because for one thing, and this gets to climate change and drought, deforestation, uh, there is no arable land left, there are no forests left. I remember, and it was quite some time ago, flying over the island of Hispaniola that's shared by the Dominican Republic in Haiti, and looking down from the airplane on a clear day, we were headed to Santo Domingo. And it's like one of those uh, maps that you had in elementary school from Rand McNally, where all the countries are colored in. And the Dominican Republic is entirely green, and Haiti is entirely red from the air. And that's because Haiti is nothing, there's nothing left but bare earth. And on the Dominican side, it's all trees and farmland. Um, and that's not new, this has been going on for over a century, but it's gotten much worse. Um, and so Haiti's problems relate to the whole region and to the whole world. They are also specific uh, to Haiti. But then if you jump around the rest of the Western Hemisphere, there are all these transnational challenges. One we've been dealing with for a long time uh, is the challenge of illegal um, cartels. And it's not just drugs. Uh, it's all sorts of other illicit activity that in many countries uh, came to be more powerful than the governments themselves. And we've seen so many countries uh, devastated by that. But then we also do have uh, the health challenges. I mean, what Brazil went through during COVID was horrific. Uh, the climate challenges, I mentioned Central America, but it's affected so much the region, the migration challenges. Uh, we uh, have always had lots of, of challenges in terms of migration from the South in this country. Uh, but in terms of, of the challenge, it was frankly usually Mexico, and that problem was largely solving itself uh, by the 1990s and the 2000s as Mexicans decided not to try to go to the United States as 
hundreds of thousands of Mexicans left the United States and went back to Mexico, partly because jobs were being created, the economy was thriving. What we're dealing with now is, is not primarily a Mexican problem. It's a Central American problem, but it's also a problem of transnational migration. Uh, we've got you know, Russians showing up on the Rio Grande in Matamoros. I have, have friends who work at our consulates there in Nuevo Laredo and, and other places, uh, Tijuana. Russians, Ukrainians, um, you know, people from actually Kosovo. I mean, it's, it, and they're making their way across the world and then in many cases coming up through the Panamanian and Colombian jungle, which is probably the most dangerous uh, place of peace of earth in the world. Uh, there's still no, no real road through the jungle from Colombia to Panama. Uh, so that's a challenge. And then the last piece is democratization. So again, if we jump back to the 1990s, the mantra was almost every country in the Western Hemisphere now has an elected democratic government with a few exceptions, and the exceptions you know, were always Cuba. Uh, but there were some others, and I worked in Central America in the 80s, and some of those governments were definitely not um, democracies and definitely did not respect human rights. And of course, Argentina and Brazil and Chile and, and Uruguay and some of the others had just been coming off military dictatorships. But by the 90s, they all had elected democratic governments. They were all doing some kind of reconciliation. And the word was, again, things were breaking our way. They even called it the Washington Consensus, that all of Latin America would follow Washington's lead economically, politically. We'll jump ahead now. Um, there's some possible uh, pieces of good news. Uh, the fact that Brazil's election appears to have been uh, honest and respected, uh, despite the violence, despite all that. On the other hand, we see Peru in absolute chaos. Uh, Venezuela is, is almost in as bad shape as Haiti. And Central America is, is tragic. It, it actually breaks my heart uh, to see what's happened there. Um, I personally will say just, and we can talk more if anybody is interested, I think we have more of a responsibility in this hemisphere uh, to address some of these problems. Uh, we have done things like deport convicted felons uh, from the United States by the hundreds of thousands over the past 30 years to countries that absolutely don't have the capacity to absorb them. In many cases, these felons do not speak the local languages, whether it's Haitian Creole or Spanish. Uh, many of them have, have learned their felonious skills on the streets of American cities. And they have gone home and destabilized their, their ancestral countries. And you know, we would never put people on a plane back to France or Spain or frankly even Argentina or Brazil and tell the countries, by the way, there's a plane arriving at eight o'clock in the morning and it's gonna have your, your people on it that are convicted of crimes here in the United States and we're just sending them home to you whether you like it or not. You can't do that under international law, it's blatantly illegal. But we do it to Central America every day by the thousands and they don't have the capacity and they, they don't agree. We just land the planes and say, we deal with these people. And unfortunately, we've seen the consequence. Uh, why is that? Because in the 1990s, we passed the law aimed at saving money, saying if somebody murders somebody on the streets of Houston, let's say, and they're not an American citizen, we don't want to pay you know, $50,000 a year to keep them in prison for the next 40 years. It costs a lot of money. So let's just kick them out and send them home. Well, that was. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, a huge uh, disservice. But also economically, agriculture, you know, the fact that we're still growing sugar in this country, uh, which is a sensitive issue in Florida and Louisiana, but it's ridiculous, and we're growing entirely with, with uh, immigrant labor brought here on temporary visas, because no American citizen or legal resident will cut sugar cane for any reason, on pain and imprisonment, because it's one of the most horrible jobs you can have in the world. Uh, but nonetheless, we then put tariffs on sugar from Latin America in countries where the people want to export it and it's their livelihood. Things like that. So there's all sorts of aspects that I think we could do more to help our neighbors. Um, it, it's a lot. Um, but, um, and again, some of this stuff can't just be done by us. We need a more cooperative approach. Absolutely. Uh, to end, in terms of my questions, and turn it over to the audience, can you just uh, tell us a bit about the American Foreign Service Association, what it does, um, how it represents the interests of uh, the retired and active career U.S. diplomats? 
Sure. So uh, we have the United States Foreign Service, which is not just the State Department. It's actually uh, five federal agencies and departments. I have my uh, dear friend and colleague, John McCaslin, here, uh, who retired from the Foreign and Commercial Service of the U.S. Commerce Department. They're part of the Foreign Service. Our uh, agency for international development is. And we've got about 20,000 uh, people serving both in the U.S. and around the world, representing our country diplomatically, promoting U.S. trade and exports, doing international development assistance. Uh, and uh, we have in the American Foreign Service Association both the professional uh, association of U.S. diplomacy, and that's going back 99 years to 1924. We're about to celebrate our centennial. And then for the past 50 years, we have been the recognized labor union of the U.S. Foreign Service and all of our agencies ever since the federal government unionized in 1972 uh, when President Nixon made a deal with Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters Union to sign the legislation. True story, you can look it up. Um, passed by the Democratic Congress, signed by President Nixon. Um, so in that role, we defend our members individually. We negotiate with all of the agencies. We don't have the right to strike. We don't have the right to negotiate salaries. Congress sets the salaries of all federal employees. But we get to negotiate just about everything else. But then we also do outreach, like like today, like this is in Pittsburgh, like our monthly magazine, like the webinars and videos that we do to try to tell the American people who we are, what the foreign services, but also why diplomacy is so important, why it's so much cheaper and more effective uh, than constantly resorting to, to military uh, reaction to, to crises around the world. It's not always sufficient. Sometimes we have to turn to our military. But diplomacy, uh, we like to call it the first line of defense. And it doesn't cost a lot of money when we ask people, how much do you think we spend on diplomacy and foreign assistance? You know, people will say 10, 20 percent of the federal budget. It's actually one half of one percent of the federal budget. So um, we, don't, we, we could spend more, and I can talk more about that if anybody would like. Uh, but in any event, um, that's who we are, and we're elected by our members in uh, my second term, and I'm still an uh, active duty member of the Foreign Service after 38 years. Excellent. Wonderful to have you here today, Ambassador. Thank you so much. Uh, if we could give the Ambassador. Ponderables only because this all doesn't make sense. Um, and someday historians are going to have to figure out. There are pieces of it that make a lot of sense. And one of them was at the end of the Cold War, we assumed that uh, the new countries, and there were 12 new countries plus the Baltic states whose independence was restored, that came out of the Soviet Union. Russia is not the Soviet Union, and there was, even though we frequently called the Soviet Union Russia for, for shorthand reasons. We just assumed that uh, Russia was done being an imperial power, was done being uh, a, a, an aggressive expansionist power. And it was for a while partly because it was so broke and so broken uh, that it didn't have that option. Uh, but the second thing we missed is that um, you know, Democrats with liberal uh, global viewpoints did not in the end take over the world's largest country with the world's largest uh, reserves of natural resources, the world's largest uh, arsenal of nuclear weapons, uh, the KGB did, uh, together with the Russian Mafia. And a lot of people left the KGB to become part of the Russian Mafia in the 1990s to the point where the lines blurred. Uh, but what you basically have now, and it's gradually become more and more apparent, is a KGB Mafia state uh, run for the benefit of the people who run it, uh, based on mostly falsehoods, um, not entirely, but based on mostly falsehoods about Russian history and Russia's interests, uh, with a population that is terribly ill-served by this. Uh, those of us who traveled across Russia 
uh, know just how poor and undeveloped the country is. You still really can't drive across Russia the way you can drive it across Canada, the US, Australia, South Africa, you name it. There isn't really a road across Russia in 2023. There's theoretically one, don't try in the winter for sure. It'll take you about four weeks. I mean it. Easy four weeks. Um, but also, you know, one of the things that we're hearing now with this horrific Russian invasion of Ukraine is all the Russian soldiers who are stunned at how well the Ukrainian people, including in the small villages, were living and, and the kind of questions they asked, which the Ukrainians actually picked up when they monitored the cell phones, and they said things like, how come they have flush toilets and we don't? Um, and then there was this entire meme that became, you've probably seen it, where so many Russian soldiers were looting appliances and sending them home to, to mom and uh, spouses and girlfriends, because there are almost no female Russian soldiers that like Ukrainian. Um, and it became a meme, but, but they did. Um, they were literally, and there was a famous call, the Ukrainians intercepted, where some guy calls his mother and says, Mom, you know, I hope to see you in a month if I survive. And she says, don't forget the planter. <laughs> um, now you can laugh because, honestly, I think we should laugh, but it's, it's terrible, it's tragic, it's horrible. Um, and um, in terms of life expectancy, health, but then in terms of what's gradually happened in Ukraine, partly under Russian pressure, there is really a national identity and a, a, a deeply ingrained sense of, of nationhood that was always there, but was always, I think, somewhat diluted by Russian power and colonialization, as in so many other countries, and it has come together. Um, and I don't think the Russians realize that the way a lot of us realized it, because you know, I, I worked on the, the first Russian invasion in 2014, with the Maidan crisis, um, I think they still don't realize it still. And so to answer your fundamental question, what's really scary is Russia can't take Ukraine. It, it's not possible. They can use nuclear weapons to wipe Ukraine off the face of the earth. They have that capability just as they have the capability to wipe the United States and the whole globe off the face of the earth. They, they literally do. Um, you know, people say, do you think that's likely? I say, no, I certainly don't think that's likely. God forbid, no, I, I can't imagine, I don't think so. Uh, but short of that, um, they could probably just about hold a lot of the territory they've seized, but it's in ruins. And the Ukrainians aren't going to stop fighting. Um, they don't have the military ability to try to go back and take Kiev and central Ukraine. Most so are we looking at a World War I style trench warfare for years with horrific attrition and casualties? I, I hope not. Uh, but the Ukrainians are not going to submit. Um, then people say, well, the Russians are trying to divide us from our allies and ultimately they may succeed. And my candid answer is they may. I sure hope not. Um, my colleagues are working really hard to have that not happen. And I believe even countries like Germany and Italy that were, I would say, somewhat uh, romantically inclined toward uh, post-Soviet Russia have a new view now, and you see that in their politics. And even some of the politicians who've been pretty friendly to Putin are backing off now because it doesn't play well, because people can see, I mean, atrocities now are on every cell phone and every, you know, just go to YouTube, you can see it all, nobody can hide what's going on. So um, I honestly am somewhat optimistic that the, the democratic world, and you know, I don't know how it's about a third of the world, maybe 40% if we're lucky, um, which includes the majority still of the world's industrial capability and economy, but China is a big piece of that that isn't. I think we'll hold together. Um, but the imponderables are so great. Will Putin survive? But if he's overthrown, what happens? Um, we really don't know. So uh, I would just say we can't as a country and, and as a, an alliance with our democratic allies across the world, we can't let Russia just say we decided that this country is not a country and we're going to wipe it off the face of the earth. We, we made a big deal when Saddam Hussein did that to Kuwait, which was a country of 900,000 people. Um, this is a country of 40 million in the heart of Europe. Uh, we just we can't allow that to be sustained because it won't be the end, it'll be the beginning of a horrific rest of the century. Has it surprised you how inept the Russian military is? Because it certainly has surprised 
I mean, yes and no. Um, the equipment does not surprise me because um, we, we knew that a lot of the modernization uh, was not real, that there was so much theft and graft and corruption, uh, and that they were still so far behind on military technology and didn't really have the money, nor have they since the end of the Soviet Union. Um, I was not terribly surprised that the military, in terms of people, performed so badly because we saw that all the time, how top heavy, you know, we would frequently, when we would work on global crises with the Russians, when we would send peacekeeping missions, which sometimes we've done with them, like in Bosnia, like uh, in Africa, you know, we would send lieutenants and captains and maybe majors, and they would send colonels and one-star generals and two-star generals, and their generals and admirals all were at least 70 pounds overweight with a massive belly, um, which frankly comes from living high on the hog, literally. Uh, but more importantly, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, we sent emergency aid to Russia when they had this terrible crisis with forest fires and Piedmont fires in 2010. And it's hard to imagine only 13 years ago we were sending humanitarian assistance to Russia, but we were. And I'll never forget these two brand new C-130 transports landed on the runway uh, at Nukova Airport in Moscow. And I was on the, the tarmac to greet them along with our military attaches. And the plane comes to a stop. And you can see right by the doors, the door opens, the names of the two non-commissioned officers who are in charge of that plane were stenciled next to the door of the plane. The non-commissioned officers, the NCOs, own the plane. They're in charge. The pilots just fly. And when these two sergeants stepped off the plane and to be greeted by these Russian colonels, uh, there was this silence. Then the two pilots in this brand new, I don't know, $100 million C-130, $250 million, whatever it costs, and the two pilots were both lieutenants, and I'd estimate they were 25 years old, maybe 24. And look on the Russian's face was just incredulous. You, know, you would never let kids fly these planes. Only, you know, 60-year-old colonels who earned the right to fly them get to fly them. Well, you know what? You'd much rather, you should much rather have 25-year-old hotshot uh, lieutenants flying these planes than 60-year-old overweight colonels. Um, but, so there were things like that. And then when we tried to talk to them, well, how do you empower your non-commissioned officers and NCOs? Their answer was, empower them, of course, no, we don't empower them, we, we don't let them do anything, they're, you know, enlisted, they're not, um, so, I mean, you could tell from the country, but, um, still, I would say it was even a shock, and I think it was a shock to the Ukrainians how badly the Russians fought, um, that, but that doesn't mean their nuclear weapons don't work, so I would just <laughs> offer that, I, it might, I mean, but we don't know that, and we don't want to go there, so. So we have about five minutes left. We have a question in the back, and we're going to maybe do a lightning round if we can. Um, and I'm trying to go in the order of the hands that I saw, but in the back. Good evening. Thank you for being here today. My question is, what is the state of U.S. diplomacy when it comes to indigenous American people here in America? Who may not belong to the BIA, who remains autonomous, where is the, the diplomacy for us? Okay, um, real, real quick, um, in terms of some indigenous people uh, who are United States citizens, um, specifically uh, Pacific Islanders, uh, there is recognition in some cases uh, of their sovereignty and they are reflected in our diplomacy and there are times when the U.S. government represents them at their request, uh, but there is no recognition in diplomacy of Native American uh, groups that signed treaties with the United States government in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And I can tell you I dealt with a case in Honduras where we had a member of the Navajo Nation who came and somehow got into Honduras on a Navajo passport because at that point the Navajo Nation was issuing passports. And the Hondurans came to us and said, you know, what do we do with this? And we said, well, we don't recognize the passport, but we do know that this person is an American citizen, so you should feel free to let them return to the United States, and we will have no objection. But no, we cannot officially recognize a passport other than a United States passport. So this is you know, the subject of, of massive uh, litigation going back decades and centuries. Um, I have my personal views about it. 
and I, I suspect a lot of people in the audience do too, but there's very little recognition of Native American uh, rights in terms of diplomacy. House Congress Resolution 331 and 100 of Congress Second Session clearly states that you know, we have a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States and it's not being honored. Thank you. Uh, the other question was a blue shirt here in the front. Um, this is a question for uh, Ambassador uh, Ruben. I was curious, uh, what event in your career do you think helped you grow uh, the most professionally in terms of learning more about uh, international relations and how all of that works? I was just curious, what helped you kind of yeah, grow? So I would say the uh, roughly, I guess it was about eight years that I spent working on our response to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, uh, the things that came out of that, which in terms of Bosnia and Kosovo, the Bosnia and Kosovo pieces of the breakup of Yugoslavia, led to what were at that point the first real uh, atrocities and carnage and violence on the European continent since 1945. Uh, that shattered some of my uh, naive expectations for what the future looked like. And I was one of the people who was reading the atrocity reports, the reports of forcible rape camps that had been set up, uh, the slaughter of thousands of, of villagers in Srebrenica. Uh, and um, frankly, that was the moment I began to be a little bit less starry-eyed about the world. Um, but in a way, it was probably necessary. Jump ahead to 2022 and the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the, the death and suffering and all that that's happened. Um, it, frankly, it's, it's unfortunately shattered some of my uh, hopeful illusions as well about the world. But I haven't given up hope and I haven't given up a made sense of optimism only because um, I've seen a lot of good come out of diplomacy. I've seen a lot of good come from this country. And I say that acknowledging that I'm, I'm very critical of our country's history on a lot of things, including things I've worked on where I think we, we messed it up and continue to mess it up in some cases. So I'm by no means um, endorsing all of that. But I, 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 I do see the possibility for positive change and for solving problems. And I'd rather see it done through diplomacy than through the armed force if possible. Thank you so much. Um, we are at time. If it feels like we can go for another hour. And Hope Ambassador, you can stick around for a few moments. Sure. Um, please uh, join me in thanking Ambassador Rubin. Once again, Point Park University, our partners at Global Shapers Pittsburgh, Luminari, and Global Pittsburgh. Um, and most of all, again, all of you and the ambassador for being here with us, for having this rich conversation, for caring about the world. So thank you for that. Please stick around, connect with each other, and connect with the ambassador, and we're here to answer any questions. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.